If you have your Bible, Genesis 44, we're continuing verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the book of Genesis. Title for our message, it's on the screen. We're going to see how far we make it. Try and get through chapter 44 and a little into 45. Uh, the cliffhanger at the end of 44 was just too much. We had to just get those few first, thank you, you read ahead. Uh, the first few verses of chapter 45 in that powerful moment that we see. Uh, I'm sure many of us, as we, as we come together this morning, there's some trouble in our hearts. Uh, the events of this last week, in, in many ways and for many reasons, right? You got one party that prematurely claimed victory and maybe inappropriately the other party says, well, it's fake and false and they have evidence of, of interference and, and fraud and all the rest. I can speak for myself this week. It's been, it's been like that, man. There have been times when, when I've had to get back to that place of peace in the Lord, right? Where my rest is being robbed because I'm concerned. I'm concerned as a father, right? For my kids. I'm concerned as a pastor for you. I've been praying for you this week. And many of you, I was approached by, by several last week. If this election goes this way, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And this is real, and frankly, that's okay. It's okay to feel that way. I have felt that way um, this week, and I feel that way today. But what we do, even in the midst of the, man, we don't have a decision. We don't know the outcome yet. Not really. And we don't like that place, do we? That place of, of man, just wonder, bewilderment, right? But what we're going to do today is we're going to open God's word. We're going to come to the Lord's table. We're going to receive everything that we need to sustain our lives and our ministries and so on and so forth. And when we go our way today, uh, even though we're in this place still, we're going to continue the work that the Lord has called us to. And that is to proclaim his goodness and his faithfulness and his salvation, regardless of what's going on in the world. Amen. And so come with me. Let's come to the Lord's table today. Let's open his word. He's going to speak to you this morning. I pray you, you jot down some notes, you type into your phones or tablets what he speaks to you, and that you do all that he tells you to do. Can you amen that this morning? was reminded of this proverb among many other verses this week, Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe right? The Lord is our refuge and strength, a ever-present help in time of need. And for all of us in one way or another, this is the one place that we get to go, and that's to the Lord and to his word today. So we're going to continue. Good morning, Pastor James, Pastor Andy. We're going to continue our, our study, break it up into three little sections as we have been doing. Uh, here we are with the family, the sons of Jacob, they're sent back down into Egypt to get a little grain again. God is at work. There's a lot to observe here about family life, about living for the Lord, walking by faith, and certainly uh, we see Jesus in this passage as well. So let's pray and uh, we'll dedicate our study to the Lord. Father, we thank you that you're here with us this morning. We thank you that you invite us to listen and hear what the Spirit will say to the church today. Lord, if we're here in the sanctuary, if we're watching somewhere else, God, speak to our hearts. And as is our prayer, make us such a people, Lord, that can serve you and represent you well in these last days, Lord, and in these times. We thank you. We love you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your word and the freedom we have to proclaim it. God, give us ears to hear, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, amen, amen. Well, Genesis 44, verse 1, I'm going to start this morning. As we continue our story here, if you weren't with us last week, hello, if you weren't with us last week, you can always listen to those messages on our app and website and, and many other ways. But jumping right back into our story, as we said, then he commanded, that is Joseph, the steward of his house, his head servant there, fill the men's, that is his brother's, sacks with food, with grain, as much as they can carry, and just like he did before, put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, so he sees it when he opens it. Here's the interesting change, and put my cup, a special cup, a 
uh, symbolic cup, this silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. And as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They headed home. They had gone only a short distance from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Up, grab your sword, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, What have you done, right? Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this, this cup that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You've done evil in so doing this. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words, and they said to him, and listen to this, the response of these guys, these brothers, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your house? Whichever of your servants is found with that cup, with their money, shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants. The servants said, okay, sounds good. Let it be as you say. He who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you can go free. You can go home. You shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and there it is. He searched beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. There's the setup. And they what? See you, buddy. Later, little bro. Right? Bye, Benjamin. Right? No. Look at the response we see from these guys, and what a journey of faith it's been and of growth. Then they what? Tore their clothes... And every man loaded his donkey, and they all went back with Brother Benjamin to the city. Now, we're in the middle of our story here. You have to kind of know where we've been to understand where we are, but we'll do our best to paint the whole picture for you today. Joseph here, as we're reading, he set his brothers up without question. Um, it's clear what his intent was. And again, we followed this story from beginning to where we are now. It wasn't retribution. He wasn't trying to trick or torture his brothers. He wasn't trying to abuse them the way that they abused him. We already know and we've discussed that Joseph had forgiven these guys completely for everything that they had done when he was younger years and years ago. Here's what this setup was for. It was to determine if there was any hope for a future relationship with his brothers and with his family. Are we going to be able to have fellowship from this point forward? The setup is this, and it's this principle that we call out and discuss today. There can be no true fellowship, that is, there can be no real relationship without repentance. When wrong has occurred, there can't be a restoration between those two parties without repentance. It's impossible. Something in between you, it's not going to happen. And so here the setup is seen and it's clear. Could these two families be reunited? Could they live together and fellowship with one another? You know, have Thanksgiving and all the rest and Christmas time. Could Joseph raise his kids around his brothers and their children without worrying what they're going to do to his kids and how they're going to torture them and abuse them and mistreat them and sell them into slavery and all the rest? And so the setup is seen here to determine what was in the heart of his brothers. Joseph would set them up. Right? To see so clearly, to observe their character, to see into their, their minds, right? He set them up here. How can a man know, hello, how can a man know what's in the mind, the heart, the soul of another man, another person? We can't, right? Only God can know that. But the Lord's given us a way to evaluate what's in the heart, the mind, the soul of another person. To see where a person's at. A means of identifying what their intentions are. And here's what the Lord says. We see it here. The Lord says, and I'll read the verse in just a moment. He says, just watch them. Listen to them. See how they respond to certain settings and certain scenarios, right? And everything that you see from that person's life, everything that you hear, compare it with my word. 
and my word will tell you where they're at and what their intentions are and what's in their heart and what's coming out of their soul and all the rest. How can one man know where another man is truly at? What his intentions are or her, right? The Lord tells us, and Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 17, it's on the screen in the NLT, Jesus said, a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce good fruit and a bad tree can't produce bad fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. You don't eat what it puts out. Yes, he says, and focus on this, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, and this is the main point of the metaphor here, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, pomegranate apple or orange or whatever, right? So you can identify people by what? By their actions. Read that with me, that last verse. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And so Joseph sets them up here, and we get this because we've studied it. This little scenario, he can see what's going to come out from them, their intention, their character. And of course, he's being guided by God through all of this. And it worked, right? He immediately sees what came out of their heart, the growth, the faith, the sincerity, what their intentions were by this setup. Here's what we see from the brothers. Joseph's setup, right? The, the trap is, is laid and they fall right in and he's got them right where he wants them. What's the response, the first thing we see from these brothers? It's on the screen. The first thing we see is that they trusted each other. Now, if you've been with us, you know these boys and their history. Man, these are, these are some terrible dudes. These are killers and murderers and, and not much better than rapists and all the rest, right? These guys have some family dysfunction, selling Joseph into slavery. Some said, kill him and throw him in a pit and throw some dirt over and let's leave him there, this dreamer, this one who wants to have authority over us and all the rest. They certainly didn't stand together previously, but here, look at what they say. How could you say this? Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants all to do this thing that you've accused us of. Behold, all right, give, give me that mic. Hello, I get to Donahue it up today. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we, and, and note the, the unity here, how then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with that shall die. And will also be my Lord's servants. Uh, they didn't say hey, it wasn't me, it's probably that guy. Meanwhile, I'm going to ride away to safety, right? It's not in my bag, but it's probably in Reuben's bag or whatever, right? They didn't say anything like that. They trusted each other. None of us could have or would have done this. Secondly, they supported each other. That is, they stood up for each other. There was solidarity. There was camaraderie here. And we see that when the cup was found in Benjamin's bag, they all loaded up their donkeys and returned back to Egypt to face the music together, right? They didn't just say again, later, buddy. See you, Benjamin. We're, we're going home. Tough luck for you, man. You probably shouldn't have done that. Ha, 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 as, as brothers might, might do, right? What did they do here? They tore their clothes, that ultimate sign of grief, Right? Every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. If we're going down for this, we're all going down together, right? And so this worked, and, and the other boys will get into it a little further. This was a great test for Joseph. It worked. He could see the fruit. He could see the character come out of these guys by this, this setup. And of course, again, as we said, this whole thing was, was governed over by the Lord. And so bring in mind to a close, this is a great test for Joseph, but what can we learn from this? I'm not suggesting that you set up each other, husbands, wives, whatever, with little tests for the people in your lives. That's not a good idea at all. This is a unique situation with Joseph, and we should recognize that as such. If you want to lose all your friends and your loved ones, hey, go for it, right? 
But the key is you don't have to set them up. Life has its own way of setting us up, right? The Lord has ways of exposing what's in our heart. When our character, be it good or bad, comes out, we can see exactly where we are with him and everyone else can too, right? So we don't need to set each other up. I think the primary point that we can pull from this, and I say this with as much boldness as I can muster today, we Christians must be more discerning these days about the fruit that we're eating. We don't have to set each other up. We need to inspect the things that are a part of our lives and that we invite to be a part of our lives. And we can apply this in every area of life when it comes to teachers of the Bible. Us up here on the stage today, professing prophets and authors and conference speakers, it certainly applies to those who teach the Word of God, but it also comes and applies to people that we hang out with and socialize with, those that we allow to socialize with our children, and hey, you sleep over there, and they'll come sleep over here and all the rest. This applies when it comes to where we give our money, and that is God's money. This applies to who we work with. This, this applies to anyone or anything that we allow unlimited access into our lives. How about what our kids are being taught in their schools, right? This applies to virtually every area of the Christian life. And the, the thought is this, we must be more discerning about the fruit that we're eating. Everything in life is having an effect. And the Bible uses this metaphor, everything is producing fruit. The question is, is it good fruit? Should you be eating it? Should your kids be ingesting it? We've got to examine everything before we allow it into our hearts, before we consume it. We as Christians, God help us, have got to read our Bibles more and test everything that we hear from every source. Test that by the word of God. Whatever's good, whatever's good fruit, eat it enjoy it, be blessed by it, but whatever is revealed to be rotten, don't eat it. Don't consume it. Don't put it in front of your kids. Protect people from it. Pray for those who are peddling it, right? But you don't have to eat it. You don't have to ingest it. If the Bible reveals that, whatever it may be, to be rotten, not good fruit. My point this morning in this section is simply this, this is a call to Christian discernment to examine what's going on, to examine what's on our fork before we put it in our mouth. This has nothing to do, and I trust you know, with judging a person's salvation. Well, how can you judge where another person's at? I would never do that. But what we're called to do, as we read, is examine the fruit before we take it into our lives. And that fruit becomes one with us because it does whenever you eat anything. You assimilate it. And it then works its way out through your life and your body. We're simply talking this morning about inspecting a well before you drink from it. Inspect someone's life. If you're single today, inspect that person's life for a period of time before you agree to marry them till death do us part right? Look for good fruit. Oh, we're in love. That's fantastic. I'm in love still, 20 years, right? But you're going to take that time and check that fruit out. You're going to examine whether that's real and true and factual or not. We're going to take the time to inspect someone for a season before we marry them. You're going to consider that person's character before you invest all that you have in their whatever, ministry, money-making opportunity. It's character that counts. Words are so often worthless. They're free. They come in a dictionary, man. You can string together all the words that you want. You can make them sound so pretty. And our enemy excels in that area. It's character that counts. Examine character, and you won't regret it ever. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16, this is in the Phillips translation, here I am, he says to his disciples, sending you out like sheep with wolves all around you. So be wise. Be wise. We need to be wise in these last days, discerning in all things. 
Be wise and yet harmless, innocent. But be on your guard against men, Jesus says here. And I pray that that's a word that can wake us up maybe in some ways today. Wrapping this up, as Christians, and I'm going to just throw all this out at you quickly, as Christians, we forgive absolutely. We love unconditionally. We hope completely, but we do not trust blindly. We don't do that as leaders and as fathers and mothers and and so on and so forth. We look for good fruit before we let our guard down completely. Listen, especially with those who have injured us or injured others in the past. It doesn't mean God can't change them. In fact, we're looking for that good fruit to celebrate with them the change that God has brought into their life. The Lord commands his people, Matthew 3, 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That is, bear the good fruit of repentance, which is change. If you've repented from your past, praise the Lord. We're looking for that good fruit in your life. We're going to celebrate that change with you as it comes. We're servants as Christians, but we're not doormats. We're givers, we're not suckers. We suffer loss, but we don't sacrifice the safety of our children, ever. We're do-gooders. We're do-gooders, but not dummies. Love must be given away freely with no expectation of a return, but trust must be earned. Especially when it comes to those that God has commanded us to care for and watch over, right? What does it mean when Jesus says that our enemy will come as a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? We got to be careful. We got to consider the fruit before we give our sheep away. I tell you, A hundred different stories um, from our ministry flooded my my heart and mind as as I considered this this week. And with all of those counseling sessions in mind, um, I would just say this. There are many Christians who, who have misunderstood this principle and are hurt terribly by others because of it. And that's why we take the time to talk about it today, right? I would say this, live with an open heart, but inspect the fruit before you ingest it, before you take it and you pass it on to those coming up underneath you and say, it's all good, it's okay, eat it up, take it in, right? We've got to be careful. We must be discerning as Christians. We must inspect that fruit before we eat it. Amen? In many ways, that's what Joseph's doing here. He's seeing where his brothers are at before he commits himself fully to them. I pray that we do that. God bless you. Amen, amen. Let's continue on in our passage, starting with verse 14. We're going to look at that, the the fruit of repentance in the lives of the brothers, specifically with Judah. And so in verse 14, it says, When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell before him to the ground. Interestingly, just like like, like Pastor Aaron had just said, right, they could have said, well, see you later, Ben. You know, good luck, right? We're, we're, the cup wasn't with us, right? We're innocent of this, right? Uh, But no, they decided to go with him back into Egypt, and they meet up with Joseph. In verse 15, Joseph says to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And most Bible students don't believe that that Joseph is referring to literal divination, but rather he's portraying the role of an Egyptian ruler, hiding the fact that he's actually a Hebrew, right, and knows the God who is Yahweh, the one that they worship, uh, the God of of, of Jacob, Isaac, and, and Abraham, and so on and so forth. And in verse 16 it says, Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found 
shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. So interestingly, Judah recognizes his guilt, their guilt, right? In verse 16, God has found out the guilt of your servants. Now, Judah knows full well that he is technically uh, innocent, right? And when we hear like some kind of false accusation geared towards us, right? We're, we're quick to defend ourselves. Oh, no, you don't understand the situation. Like, oh, I have, you know, a, a right or I have an, a, an excuse, right? Not recognizing the total depravity of our flesh and the extent of the sinfulness of man. Every single individual is far and above and beyond anything that any accusation might come against us. Uh, and so uh, he understood his guilt ultimately before God. Uh, they may not have stolen no cup, but the guilt before God uh, was far greater than any of that. We need to understand the, the, the state of our spiritual condition, that we are sinners, right? The Bible says that none are good. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And when we come into that realization, there isn't pride, or there shouldn't be pride, right? There shouldn't be defensiveness. Uh, there should be brokenness, right? There should be repentance, uh, there should be understanding of the need that we have for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so continuing on, it says in verse 18, Then Judah went up to him and said, O oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not your, servant, or your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father and an old man uh, and, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, uh, referring to Joseph, and he alone is, is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Verse 21, then he said to your servants, bring him down to me uh, that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. Verse 24, when we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when, your, when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down for we cannot see the man's face unless our younger brother is with us, right? They can't go back to Egypt unless uh, they, they show Benjamin to this Egyptian governor who they don't realize is actually their brother Joseph. Verse 27, then your, then your, uh, your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me and I said, surely he has been torn to pieces, right? The brother presented, the brothers presented to uh, Jacob this, this bloody garment that belonged to Joseph, and, and he assumed that Joseph somehow died, was eaten alive by animals, or who knows, right? And I have never seen him since. Verse 29, if you take this one from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol, that is the grave. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, Jacob, with sorrow to Sheol, that is the grave. It's been 22 years since they betrayed Joseph. They sold him into slavery, right? Uh, let's see what happens to this dreamer. They were jealous. They were angry, murderously angry, like Pastor Aaron had said, right? They wanted to kill him, right? And then they said, no, let's just sell him into slavery, right? Uh, that way we can feel a little less guilty, but still get rid of him, right? And then they took the garment, the, 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 the coat that belonged to Joseph that signified that he was the, the favored son, and they killed a, an animal and, and covered the coat with blood, and they said, what could have happened to him, right? And it's been 22 years since that occurred. They didn't care back then about Jacob's grief. They didn't care about breaking the heart 
of their dad. And yet something changed during that time. There's a repentance. There's a recognition of their sinfulness. And there's a brokenness about them that wasn't present 22 years ago, right? Judah didn't care about what his father thought 22 years ago. And now he cannot face the man knowing uh, that they, they're, they're, they're coming back without Benjamin, knowing that Benjamin is separated from uh, Jacob. And he won't do that, right? And likewise, you see the difference between the carnal man and the broken man. The carnal man doesn't care about what the Heavenly Father thinks. The carnal man doesn't care about the state of his relationship with God. The carnal man doesn't care about his eternal destination, whether he's going to be with Christ in heaven or going to be separated from God in an, in, in an internal sense, right? In eternal damnation. And the carnal man doesn't think about any of that, that spiritual reality. But the broken man, uh, the, the man who's repentant, the man who says, I am sinful and I need a cure. I need Jesus Christ to come and heal this broken heart, this broken spiritual state. That individual is completely mindful and realizes the heart of God. It, it, it mourns over the lost. It mourns over the one who is separated from him, right? He, he'll leave the 99 for the one. And his heart is so for the loss that he came down incarnate, right, in human flesh and gave his life as a sacrifice. And so Jesus Christ took upon himself the punishment that belonged to us. We deserved wrath. We deserved eternal damnation. We deserve the wrath of God to be poured out on us, separating us from God for eternity. And yet Jesus took our price, uh, that is the, 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 the punishment for our sin, and took it upon himself. Judah, there's a lack of blame shifting, right? He didn't blame his dad. He didn't blame Pharaoh, like, you're the one that wanted Benjamin here, right? It's your fault that the cup was stolen, you know, this is all your fault. He didn't blame the famine. He didn't blame God, oh, you know, it was my upbringing. It was where I was born. It was my messed up dysfunctional family that made me the way I am, and now I can't help it, right? He doesn't do any of that, right? He says, we are guilty. I am guilty. And in recognizing our brokenness, recognizing our sinful state, is the first step in receiving the grace that God is freely giving you. But we need to be humble and we need to receive that free gift. Pride will turn that gift away. Pride will say, I don't need that. I'm, I'm just fine, right? I'm not, I'm, there's, there's much worse sinners than I am, right? I'm not Hitler. I've never killed a man, right? But Judah had a change of heart as a product of repentance. And in verse 33, up into the end of the chapter, it says, Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Right? And so Judah's saying, take me instead right? Let Benjamin and the rest go back home, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be your servant, I'll be your slave, I'll be in prison, or whatever, right? Whatever it is. And the substitutionary offer is indicative of what Christ did for us. And we've said it before, right, that Jesus Christ would eventually come from the line of Judah. And so there's this beautiful prophecy that comes out of a humble heart. What is the result of a humble and repentant heart? A person who becomes more like Jesus, right? When we repent in brokenness, when we repent in, in, in receiving the grace of God, Christ does a beautiful work in making us more like Him. We can either continue in stubbornness or we can grow in humility, allowing ourselves to decrease, right? 
well, the character, the nature, and the love of Christ in our heart increases. If that's you this morning, if there's a sin that, you know, you, you, you've hid perhaps 22 years, right? Time, I, and I, I heard this uh, from another pastor, he says, uh, time does not cover sin. Only the grace and the work of Jesus Christ can cover sins. And it does even better than that. It doesn't just cover the sins, it reconciles us to God, Right? And it doesn't just reconcile us to God, even though that would be far and above what we think would be more than enough. No, it makes us more like Him. It makes us more like Christ. That unconditional love, that, 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 that representative of Jesus. And so, Christian, if that's you this morning, and you want to be more like Christ, it starts with humility. It starts with repentance. It starts with receiving the grace of Jesus Christ in your life. And not just in a salvific way, right? Not just for salvation, not just a ticket to heaven, right? But in a day-to-day living. And if you're not a believer, and if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is promised to no one receive Christ and your life will be changed. These were, these were some murderous, messed up individuals, right? And they went from that, tearing up their family from the inside out. And God did a miraculous work, right? It was Christ that did the ultimate work and they received that and the Lord did awesome restoration in their lives and in their family. Amen. Amen. Well, we're not going to leave you with a cliffhanger, so let's uh, move on to verse 45. Verse 1 says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So the secret was out. But let's put ourselves in, in, in Joseph's shoes, or sandals, for, for a minute. Uh, he tests his brothers, and, and their response to him was honesty, humility, repentance, as we've just studied now. Uh, clearly, these brothers had a change of heart. And these are not the same boys that destroyed Joseph's life 22 years ago and lied to their dad's face. Something's different. Joseph saw that and he was emotionally distraught. He was, he was, he was wrecked by it, right? He wailed. He cried so hard that everybody could hear it. Right? I don't know if you've ever heard someone cry that way, but this is what was happening at this time. He must be thinking, are these really my brothers? What's gotten into them? Who are these guys? And then right then and there, he knew it was the right time to reveal himself. But, but what about the brothers? All right, let's look at their, from, let's look at the, uh, the situation from their perspective, right? Imagine someone yelling something in a foreign language, and then everybody leaves, right? Joseph yells something in Egyptian, and everybody leaves. What's going to happen? Are we going to die? What's going to happen now? And then all of a sudden, Joseph starts crying so loud that everybody could hear And they were probably thinking, why is this second in command of all of Egypt crying like this right now? And then we see the big reveal. And sure enough, the response was was fear. Uh, Our text says they were dismayed. In the Hebrew, uh, it means that they were terrified. They were scared to death. All those guilty memories, right? All those sleepless nights they probably had and everything that just had happened came rushing back at them, they probably thought, surely Joseph wanted revenge. Verse 4, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord over all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph says, it's, it's me, guys. It's, it's me. It's, it's your brother. You know, the, the one you sold into slavery. And they probably couldn't believe it. And so Joseph confirmed that it was him. Uh, nobody else knew what they did to him. So it had to be Joseph. And as the brothers were already guilty and afraid, that most likely doubled at the sound of their crime coming from the mouth of their victim. But Joseph doesn't let that last long, reassuring them and telling them not to be angry at themselves. Instead, he points to God's hand over it all, that it was God who orchestrated all these things to happen. And this brings us back to that truth that we learned about Joseph from the, from the very beginning, that God was with him. Let's read verses 9 through 15, and we're done with our text. Hurry up, Joseph said. Go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, all that you have, there I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Basically he's saying now I'm speaking to you in Hebrew. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. So Joseph sends for Jacob to come and be reconciled with them. He sets aside the land of Goshen to be their home, and we see the passage ending with them hugging, kissing, crying, reunited, reconciled, and proceeded to talk. Now there are multiple parallels in this story regarding Joseph as a picture of Jesus. We've talked about this before, and connections to Israel as a nation. You can read and study for yourself. There's hundreds of symbolisms. But this particular story centers on Joseph's forgiveness, right? As we talked about earlier, Joseph saw their character, right? The fruit of their lives. We see them repenting, and now we see the forgiveness that he imparts, the grace and mercy that he gives his brothers as, as a perfect picture of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness to us who have wronged him. Now we can point out specific thoughts in this passage in regards to God's forgiveness. First and foremost, God's forgiveness gives us access to him. If you haven't caught on yet, we are the brothers in the story. And just like the brothers, we can, we can kind of view God's goodness as something that's too good to be true, right? And, and sometimes taking it a step further, we can view God's goodness as something to be feared, something to be scared of, right? From Joseph's point of view, it was, hey guys, it's me, it's, it's your brother Joseph. But from the brother's point of view, it's, oh no, it's him, it's, it's Joseph. And sometimes our relationship with the Lord can be like that, right? We have, a, we have the Father who loves us and, and is willing to run towards us with open arms, and we, his, his prodigal kids, are afraid to approach him. Why? Could it be guilt, shame? Could it be anger towards God, mistrust, doubt? But as much as all these reasons might be valid, God's word triumphs over all our issues. And that's why we look to the scriptures when we feel this way. It's alive, it's sharp, it pierces our hearts, discerning our thoughts and intentions. Right? I know, I know what I feel, and that's relative, but what does God say about it? That's absolute. In regards to, to coming to God, Romans 8.15 says this. It reminds us, So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we can call him Abba, Father. Paul points out that we can call God Abba. Now, if you don't know, Abba is just a term of endearment. It's like Papa or Dad. He's not far. He's near. He's not detached. He's involved. 
He's there, ready to forgive and for us to have access to him. Lastly, God's forgiveness reassures us of his love. Joseph identifies himself to his brothers once more, but this time he, he reminded them of what they did to him. Not to shame them, right? We know that, we've established that, but to reassure them. A big part of being reassured by God and his love is being reminded of who we are as sinners. And this might sound weird, but I know it doesn't take much to remind me that I'm a sinner. But instead of succumbing to shame and self-pity, we run to Jesus instead. What that does, it, it drives us to repent and repent frequently. To take advantage of the access that we talked about earlier. But just like Joseph, you know, the beautiful thing about this is that God doesn't let us stay in that place for long. That awful, awful place. The Bible is full of his, his, of his reassurances, of his promises, of his guarantees. Because God knows we need them. Notice Joseph's words, right? His concern wasn't that the brothers would think he was angry at them. No, his concern was that his brothers would be angry at themselves. We can see how quickly Joseph dismissed that thought. Now, everything was going great, but he knew that self-condemnation was going to be a stumbling block for his, his brothers, for true reconciliation to happen between them. If you're a Christian today, know this. Self-condemnation is a lie from the enemy. Because we know that Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are Christ's and his forever. No one and nothing, no man, no, no scheme of hell, no scheme of man like we've sang earlier can take you away from that. There is no more condemnation. You know, Personally speaking, growing up in a, in a legalistic and ritual-based, works-based religion, I never really understood the, 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 the biblical concept of, of forgiveness. I thought it was what came after uh, I prayed all these prayers and, and someone would give it to me on, 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 on my behalf, right? And if I did my good deeds for that day, then I'll be completely forgiven. I thought it was weird. Right? I thought it was foreign what this forgiveness thing was, what this grace thing was. But what I didn't know then, but learning more and more now, is that forgiveness is relational. That God, our Father in heaven, delights in forgiving us, his children. He loves to love on us, simply speaking. But it starts with a repentant heart. Right? We have to repent, like we've said earlier. There has to be brokenness over sin, brokenness over the fact that we break God's heart from time to time. Mm -hmm. Confession takes place and forgiveness is given by a loving and gracious Father who sent His only Son to die for us on our behalf. That's precious. That's a treasure that we receive from God. That's, that's life-changing. And that should draw us to the Lord even more as we learn of His forgiveness and what it brings, right? Right? peace of God, peace with God, and all the rest, knowing that these will never be found in anything that this world will ever offer. Nothing is like the forgiveness of God. Nothing is like the peace that comes from knowing that you are a forgiven sinner. So let's come to Jesus. Let's repent and be forgiven. And, and what reassures me is, is, is the fact that he loves us and he cares for us. He never, he never leaves us nor forsakes us. And I love what David says, and I'll close with this in the psalm. And we know David. We know his character. He's done a lot of messed up things, but he is, he's a man after God's own heart. He says this in Psalm 86.5. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love, to all who call upon you. Let's call upon the name of the Lord today. Amen, amen. Well, as we prepare to close this morning, just jotting some notes. Good job, boys. There's a version of the gospel that says, confess Jesus and just continue on the same way you always have. Continue on in the same sin that you've always lived with. There are some churches and Christians that preach that. Uh, they don't talk about sin, and certainly 
not our need to turn from it to the Lord. But unless we talk about such things, first of all, we're missing the gospel completely, right? But we're missing all of God's blessings, as we heard about this morning. Change comes through repentance, right? I acknowledge and I repent. I turn from this particular course of living because you say that's what's best for me, Lord, right? Change comes through repentance. Growth comes through repentance. The power to stop doing those things that you think has power over you comes through repentance, right? And what a thing to rip off God's people or anybody from those gifts, the gift of change, the gift of growth. Man, we need to talk about sin and God's forgiveness, repentance, and what comes as a, as a blessing along with it. Amen? Amen? Let's take a few minutes. we got a lot to pray about today before we close. I trust you took some good notes and you're going to pass it on to some friends, some brothers and sisters, maybe discuss it over lunch with somebody, have them over for dinner tonight. Consider those who aren't here today and make sure and reach out to them. Boy, we're seeing a few more trickle back in and what a blessing that is. And uh, yet there are still some that we love who are missing. Some new faces today too. God bless you. Let's pray. A lot going on. Last night downtown was on fire. They don't care about the left or the right. They just want to destroy everything. Right? We're in the middle of this crazy election thing. Uh, so let's pray. Let's bring it to the Lord. And at the end of the day, we'll talk about where we end up. Right? We don't know yet. We don't. We're in this awkward place of just kind of hanging to see what the ultimate decision will be. Either way, say it out loud, God will be faithful. God will be faithful. So we have nothing to be afraid of. You go be the kind of person that God has called you to be. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. When that's our mission, that's our goal, because I'm going to do it too, right? We will do well. Yeah, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we have compassion for people because you've placed that love within our hearts. It comes from you. And whether we agree with them or not, Lord, we pray for peace in our city. God, we pray for the safety of those who have vowed to protect us, Lord, and defend us. God, uh, put the fires out, bring the peace in. Lord, use us to be, Lord, gospel sharers and peacemakers, Lord, in every way possible. Lord, we pray for the peace of our city and for our country, this battle. Lord, we pray that it would be resolved quickly and with integrity, honestly, Lord, in fairness. We leave these things in your mighty, capable hands, and we stand ready to be used by you, Lord, as you would see fit. We are your ambassadors. Help us, Lord, to not be turned aside to the left or, or to the right, but con to continue on in what you've called us to do, and that is to be light and salt in this world, Lord. We thank you for our passions, Lord. I, I'm thankful for passionate people, Lord, but temper our passions with, with your gospel and with your love for the world, we pray. God, help us to speak when you prompt us to speak and to shut our mouths, Lord, when you give us that little nod. Lord, thank you that we have two ears to hear and one mouth and help us to listen a lot more, we pray. God, bless your people. Send us out in the, the joy of the Lord today. Thank you for the forgiveness that we found in you, Jesus, for the growth and the new life that comes through walking with you. Lord, uh, we pray that everyone who's heard the gospel over and over again today, if they have yet to receive it, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And whether it's online or streaming, Lord, um, or here in the sanctuary in the foyer, God, uh, save souls today, we pray. Turn hearts to you. God, we thank you that there are enough people in this room this morning to change the world. God, help us to make that our mission. We thank you. We love you. We commit one another and uh, our service to you today. In Jesus' name, let's say amen, amen. Be in prayer this week. Be in prayer. Uh, stand with the church in every way possible. Make sure you're given financially as the Lord blesses you to do that. Look for opportunities you have, uh, and there are plenty to step into service, some kind of ministry. Maybe the Lord's put something on your heart. Hey, come forward. Let's talk about it. There's room. There's opportunity, and uh, 
We're looking to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So come talk to us. The prayer team's going to be coming down up front. If you're here in the sanctuary, come forward, be prayed for, be blessed. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, we're going to be here for that as well. Uh, fellowship with one another. Jump into a midweek Bible study. So essential. Uh, the men had a fantastic time yesterday. If you missed men's Bible study yesterday in person, uh, come again the first Saturday of every month. What a good time it was. We love you. God bless you.